Part One of Love and Friendship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cory Samuel. Love and Friendship by Jane Austen. To Madame la Comtesse de Foyde, this novel is inscribed by her obliged humble servant, the author. Deceived in friendship and betrayed in love. Letter the first from Isabel to Laura. How often, in answer to my repeated entreaties that you would give my daughter a regular detail of the misfortunes and adventures of your life, have you said, No, my friend, never will I comply with your request till I may be no longer in danger of again experiencing such dreadful ones. Surely that time is now at hand. You are this day fifty-five. If a woman may ever be said to be in safety from the determined perseverance of disagreeable lovers, and the cruel persecutions of obstinate fathers, surely it must be at such a time of life. Isabel Letter Second Laura to Isabel Although I cannot agree with you in supposing that I shall never again be exposed to misfortunes as unmerited as those I have already experienced, yet to avoid the imputation of obstinacy or ill-nature, I will gratify the curiosity of your daughter, and may the fortitude with which I have suffered the many afflictions of my past life prove to her a useful lesson for the support of those which may befall her in her own. Laura Letter third, Laura to Marianne. As the daughter of my most intimate friend, I think you entitled to that knowledge of my unhappy story, which your mother has so often solicited me to give you. My father was a native of Ireland, and an inhabitant of Wales. My mother was the natural daughter of a Scotch peer, by an Italian opera girl. I was born in Spain, and received my education at a convent in France. When I had reached my eighteenth year, I was recalled by my parents to my paternal roof in Wales. Our mansion was situated in one of the most romantic parts of the Vale of Usk. Though my charms are now considerably softened, and somewhat impaired by the misfortunes I have undergone, I was once beautiful. But lovely as I was, the graces of my person were the least of my perfections. Of every accomplishment a customary to my sex, I was mistress. When in the convent, my progress had always exceeded my instructions, my acquirements had been wonderful for my age, and I had shortly surpassed my masters. In my mind, every virtue that could adorn it was centred. It was the rendezvous of every good quality, and of every noble sentiment. A sensibility too tremblingly alive to every affliction of my friends, my acquaintance, and particularly to every affliction of my own, was my only fault, if a fault it could be called. Alas, how altered now! Though indeed my own misfortunes do not make less impression on me than they ever did, yet now I never feel for those of another. My accomplishments too begin to fade, I can neither sing so well, nor dance so gracefully as I once did, and I have entirely forgotten the minuet de la cour. Adieu. Laura. Letter fourth, Laura to Marianne. Our neighbourhood was small, for it consisted only of your mother. She may probably have already told you that being left by her parents in indigent circumstances, she had retired into Wales on economical motives. There it was our friendship first commenced. Isabel was then one and twenty. Though pleasing both in her person and manners, between ourselves, she never possessed the hundredth part of my beauty or accomplishments. Isabel had seen the world. She had passed two years at one of the first boarding schools in London, had spent a fortnight in Bath, and had supped one night in Southampton. Beware, my Laura, she would often say, beware of the insipid vanities and idle dissipations of the metropolis of England. Beware of the unmeaning luxuries of Bath, and of the stinking fish of Southampton. Alas, 
exclaimed I, how am I to avoid those evils I shall never be exposed to? What probability is there of my ever tasting the dissipations of London, the luxuries of Bath, or the stinking fish of Southampton? I, who am doomed to waste my days of youth and beauty in a humble cottage in the Vale of Usk. Ah, little did I then think I was ordained so soon to quit that humble cottage for the deceitful pleasures of the world. Adieu, Laura. Letter fifth, Laura to Marianne. One evening in December, as my father, my mother, and myself were arranged in social converse round our fireside, we were on a sudden greatly astonished by hearing a violent knocking on the outward door of our rustic cot. My father started. What noise is that? said he. It sounds like a loud rapping at the door, replied my mother. It does indeed, cried I. I am of your opinion, said my father. It certainly does appear to proceed from some uncommon violence exerted against our unoffending door. Yes, exclaimed I. I cannot help thinking it must be somebody who knocks for admittance. That is another point, replied he. We must not pretend to determine on what motive the person may knock. Though that some one does rap at the door, I am partly convinced. Here a second tremendous rap interrupted my father in his speech, and somewhat alarmed my mother and me. "'Had we better not go and see who it is?' said she. "'The servants are out.' "'I think we had,' replied I. "'Certainly,' added my father, "'by all means.' "'Shall we go now?' said my mother. "'The sooner the better,' answered he. "'Oh, let no time be lost!' cried I. A third, more violent rap than ever, again assaulted our ears. "'I am certain there is somebody knocking at the door,' said my mother. "'I think there must,' replied my father. "'I fancy the servants are returned,' said I. "'I think I hear Mary going to the door.' "'I am glad of it,' cried my father, "'for I long to know who it is.' I was right in my conjecture for Mary instantly entering the room, informed us that a young gentleman and his servant were at the door, who had lost their way, were very cold, and begged leave to warm themselves by our fire. "'Won't you admit them?' said I. "'You have no objection, my dear?' said my father. "'None in the world,' replied my mother. Mary, without waiting for any further commands, immediately left the room, and quickly returned, introducing the most beauteous and amiable youth I had ever beheld, the servant she kept to herself. My natural sensibility had already been greatly affected by the sufferings of the unfortunate stranger, and no sooner did I first behold him than I felt that on him the happiness, or misery, of my future life must depend. Adieu, Laura. Letter six. Laura to Marianne. The noble youth informed us that his name was Lindsay. For particular reasons, however, I shall conceal it under that of Talbot. He told us that he was the son of an English baronet, that his mother had been for many years no more, and that he had a sister of the middle size. My father, he continued, is a mean and mercenary wretch. It is only to such particular friends as this dear party that I would thus betray his failings. Your virtues, my amiable Polydor, addressing himself to my father, yours, dear Claudia, and yours, my charming Laura, call on me to repose in you my confidence. We bowed. My father, seduced by the false glare of fortune and the deluding pomp of title, insisted on my giving my hand to Lady Dorothea. No, never, exclaimed I. Lady Dorothea is lovely and engaging. I prefer no woman to her but no, sir, that I scorn to marry her in compliance with your wishes. No, never shall it be said that I obliged my father." We all admired the noble manliness of his reply. He continued. Sir Edward was surprised. He had perhaps little expected to meet with so spirited an opposition to his will. "'Where, Edward, in the name of wonder,' said he, "'did you pick up this unmeaning gibberish? You have been studying novels, I suspect. I scorned to answer, it would have been beneath my dignity. I mounted my horse, and followed by my faithful William, set forth for my aunt's. 
My father's house is situated in Bedfordshire, my aunt's in Middlesex, and though I flatter myself with being a tolerable proficient in geography, I know not how it happened, but I found myself entering this beautiful vale, which I find is in South Wales, when I had expected to have reached my aunt's. After having wandered some time on the banks of the Usk, without knowing which way to go, I began to lament my cruel destiny in the bitterest and most pathetic manner. It was now perfectly dark, not a single star was there to direct my steps, and I know not what might have befallen me had I not, at length, discerned through the solemn gloom that surrounded me a distant light, which, as I approached it, I discovered to be the cheerful blaze of your fire. Impelled by the combination of misfortunes under which I laboured, namely fear, cold, and hunger, I hesitated not to ask admittance, which at length I have gained. And now, my adorable Laura," continued he, taking my hand, when may I hope to receive that reward of all the painful sufferings I have undergone during the course of my attachment to you, to which I have ever aspired? Oh, when will you reward me with yourself? This instant, dear and amiable Edward, replied I. We were immediately united by my father, who, though he had never taken orders, had been bred to the church. Adieu, Laura. Letter seventh, Laura to Marianne. We remained but a few days after our marriage in the Vale of Usk. After taking an affecting farewell of my father, my mother, and my Isabel, I accompanied Edward to his aunt's in Middlesex. Philippa received us both with every expression of affectionate love. My arrival was indeed a most agreeable surprise to her, as she had not only been totally ignorant of my marriage with her nephew, but had never even had the slightest idea of there being such a person in the world. Augusta, the sister of Edward, was on a visit to her when we arrived. I found her exactly what her brother had described her to be, of the middle size. She received me with equal surprise, though not with equal cordiality, as Philippa. There was a disagreeable coldness and forbidding reserve in her reception of me, which was equally distressing and unexpected. None of that interesting sensibility, or amiable sympathy in her manners and address to me, when we first met, which should have distinguished our introduction to each other. Her language was neither warm nor affectionate, her expressions of regard were neither animated nor cordial, her arms were not opened to receive me to her heart, though my own were extended to press her to mine. A short conversation between Augusta and her brother, which I accidentally overheard, increased my dislike to her, and convinced me that her heart was no more formed for the soft ties of love than for the endearing intercourse of friendship. "'But do you think that my father will ever be reconciled to this imprudent connection?' said Augusta. "'Augusta,' replied the noble youth, "'I thought you had a better opinion of me than to imagine I would so abjectly degrade myself as to consider my father's concurrence in any of my affairs either of consequence or concern to me. Tell me, Augusta, with sincerity, did you ever know me to consult his inclinations, or follow his advice in the least trifling particular, since the age of fifteen? Edward, replied she, you are surely too diffident in your own praise. Since you were fifteen only? My dear brother, since you were five years old, I entirely acquit you of ever having willingly contributed to the satisfaction of your father but still I am not without apprehensions of your being shortly obliged to degrade yourself in your own eyes by seeking a support for your wife in the generosity of Sir Edward. Never, never, Augusta, will I so demean myself," said Edward. Support? What support will Laura want which she can receive from him? Only those very insignificant ones of victuals and drink," answered she. Victuals and drink! replied my husband, in a most nobly contemptuous manner. And dost thou then imagine that there is no other support for an exalted mind, such as is my Laura's, than the mean and indelicate employment of eating and drinking? None that I know of so efficacious, returned Augusta. And did you then never feel the pleasing pangs of love, Augusta? replied my Edward. 
does it appear impossible to your vile and corrupted palate to exist on love? Can you not conceive the luxury of living in every distress that poverty can inflict, with the object of your tenderest affection? You are too ridiculous, said Augusta, to argue with. Perhaps, however, you may in time be convinced that— Here I was prevented from hearing the remainder of her speech, by the appearance of a very handsome young woman, who was ushered into the room at the door of which I had been listening. On hearing her announced by the name of Lady Dorothea, I instantly quitted my post, and followed her into the parlour, for I well remembered that she was the lady proposed as a wife for my Edward, by the cruel and unrelenting baronet. Although Lady Dorothea's visit was nominally to Philippa and Augusta, yet I have some reason to imagine that, acquainted with the marriage and arrival of Edward, to see me was a principal motive to it. I soon perceived that though lovely and elegant in her person, and though easy and polite in her address, she was of that inferior order of beings, with regard to delicate feeling, tender sentiments, and refined sensibility, of which Augusta was one. She stayed but half an hour, and neither in the course of her visit confided to me any of her secret thoughts, nor requested me to confide in her any of mine. You will easily imagine, therefore, my dear Marianne, that I could not feel any ardent affection or very sincere attachment for Lady Dorothea. Adieu, Laura. Letter Eighth, Laura to Marianne, in continuation. Lady Dorothea had not left us long before another visitor, as unexpected a one as her ladyship, was announced. It was Sir Edward who, informed by Augusta of her brother's marriage, came doubtless to reproach him for having dared to unite himself to me without his knowledge. But Edward, foreseeing his design, approached him with heroic fortitude as soon as he entered the room, and addressed him in the following manner. "'Sir Edward, I know the motive of your journey here. You come with the base design of reproaching me for having entered into a dissoluble engagement with my Laura, without your consent. But, sir, I glory in the act. It is my greatest boast that I have incurred the displeasure of my father." So saying, he took my hand, and whilst Sir Edward, Philippa, and Augusta were doubtless reflecting with admiration on his undaunted bravery, led me from the parlour to his father's carriage, which yet remained at the door, and in which we were instantly conveyed from the pursuit of Sir Edward. The postillions had at first received orders only to take the London road, as soon as we had sufficiently reflected. However, we ordered them to drive to M, the seat of Edward's most particular friend, which was but a few miles distant. At M, we arrived in a few hours, and on sending in our names, were immediately admitted to Sophia, the wife of Edward's friend. After having been deprived during the course of three weeks of a real friend, for such I term your mother, Imagine my transports at beholding one most truly worthy of the name. Sophia was rather above the middle size, most elegantly formed. A soft languor spread over her lovely features, but increased their beauty. It was the characteristic of her mind. She was all sensibility and feeling. We flew into each other's arms, and after having exchanged vows of mutual friendship for the rest of our lives, instantly unfolded to each other the most inward secrets of our hearts. We were interrupted in the delightful employment by the entrance of Augustus, Edward's friend, who was just returned from a solitary ramble. Never did I see such an affecting scene as was the meeting of Edward and Augustus. "'My life, my soul!' exclaimed the former. "'My adorable angel!' replied the latter, as they flew into each other's arms. It was too pathetic for the feelings of Sophia and myself. We fainted alternately on a sofa. Adieu, Laura. Letter the ninth, from the same to the same. Towards the close of day, we received the following letter from Philippa. Sir Edward is greatly incensed by your abrupt departure. He has taken back Augusta to Bedfordshire. Much as I wish to enjoy again your charming society, I cannot determine to snatch you from that of such dear and deserving friends. When your visit to them is terminated, I trust you will return to the arms of your, 
Philippa. We returned a suitable answer to this affectionate note, and after thanking her for her kind invitation, assured her that we would certainly avail ourselves of it, whenever we might have no other place to go to. Though certainly nothing could, to any reasonable being, have appeared more satisfactory than so grateful a reply to her invitation, yet I know not how it was, but she was certainly capricious enough to be displeased with our behaviour, and in a few weeks after, either to revenge our conduct, or relieve her own solitude, married a young and illiterate fortune-hunter. This imprudent step, though we were sensible that it would probably deprive us of that fortune which Philippa had ever taught us to expect, could not, on our own accounts, excite from our exalted minds a single sigh, yet fearful lest it might prove a source of endless misery to the deluded bride. Our trembling sensibility was greatly affected when we were first informed of the event. The affectionate entreaties of Augustus and Sophia, that we would for ever consider their house as our home, easily prevailed on us to determine never more to leave them. In the society of my Edward, and this amiable pair, I passed the happiest moments of my life. Our time was most delightfully spent, in mutual protestations of friendship, and in vows of unalterable love, in which we were secure from being interrupted, by intruding and disagreeable visitors, as Augustus and Sophia had, on their first entrance in the neighbourhood, taken due care to inform the surrounding families, that as their happiness centred wholly in themselves, they wished for no other society. But alas! my dear Marianne, such happiness as I then enjoyed was too perfect to be lasting. A most severe and unexpected blow at once destroyed every sensation of pleasure. Convinced, as you must be from what I have already told you concerning Augustus and Sophia, that there never were a happier couple, I need not, I imagine, inform you that their union had been contrary to the inclinations of their cruel and mercenary parents, who had vainly endeavoured, with obstinate perseverance, to force them into a marriage with those whom they had ever abhorred. But with a heroic fortitude worthy to be related and admired, they had both constantly refused to submit to such despotic power. After having so nobly disentangled themselves from the shackles of parental authority, by a clandestine marriage, they were determined never to forfeit the good opinion they had gained in the world, in so doing, by accepting any proposals of reconciliation that might be offered them by their fathers. To this further trial of their noble independence, however, they were never exposed. They had been married but a few months, when our visit to them commenced, during which time they had been amply supported by a considerable sum of money which Augustus had gracefully purloined from his unworthy father's escritoire, a few days before his union with Sophia. By our arrival, their expenses were considerably increased, though their means for supplying them were then nearly exhausted. But they, exalted creatures, scorned to reflect a moment on their pecuniary distresses, and would have blushed at the idea of paying their debts. Alas! what was their reward for such disinterested behaviour? the beautiful Augustus was arrested, and we were all undone. Such perfidious treachery in the merciless perpetrators of the deed will shock your gentle nature, dearest Marianne, as much as it then affected the delicate sensibility of Edward, Sophia, your Laura, and of Augustus himself. To complete such unparalleled barbarity, we were informed that an execution in the house would shortly take place. Ah! Oh, what could we do but what we did? we sighed and fainted on the sofa. Adieu, Laura. Letter tenth, Laura in continuation. When we were somewhat recovered from the overpowering effusions of our grief, Edward desired that we would consider what was the most prudent step to be taken, in our unhappy situation, while he repaired to his imprisoned friend to lament over his misfortunes. We promised that we would, and he set forwards on his journey to town. During his absence we faithfully complied with his desire, and after the most mature deliberation, at length agreed that the best thing we could do was to leave the house, of which we every moment expected the officers of justice to take possession. We waited, therefore, with the greatest impatience, for the return of Edward, in order to impart to him the result of our deliberations. 
but no Edward appeared. In vain did we count the tedious moments of his absence, in vain did we weep, in vain even did we sigh, no Edward returned. This was too cruel, too unexpected a blow to our gentle sensibility, we could not support it, we could only faint. At length, collecting all the resolution I was mistress of, I arose, and after packing up some necessary apparel for Sophia and myself, I dragged her to a carriage I had ordered, and we instantly set out for London. As the habitation of Augustus was within twelve miles of town, it was not long ere we arrived there, and no sooner had we entered Holborn than letting down one of the front glasses, I inquired of every decent-looking person that we passed if they had seen my Edward. But as we drove too rapidly to allow them to answer my repeated inquiries, I gained little, or indeed no, information concerning him. "'Where am I to drive?' said the postillion. "'To Newgate, gentle youth,' replied I, "'to see Augustus.' "'Oh, no, no!' exclaimed Sophia. "'I cannot go to Newgate. I shall not be able to support the sight of my Augustus in so cruel a confinement. My feelings are sufficiently shocked by the recital of his distress but to behold it will overpower my sensibility." As I perfectly agreed with her in the justice of her sentiments, the postillion was instantly directed to return into the country. You may perhaps have been somewhat surprised, my dearest Marianne, that in the distress I then endured, destitute of any support, and unprovided with any habitation, I should never once have remembered my father and mother, or my paternal cottage in the Vale of Usk. To account for this seeming forgetfulness, I must inform you of a trifling circumstance concerning them, which I have as yet never mentioned. The death of my parents, a few weeks after my departure, is the circumstance I allude to. By their decease I became the lawful inheritress of their house and fortune. But alas, the house had never been their own, and their fortune had only been an annuity on their own lives. Such is the depravity of the world. To your mother I should have returned with pleasure, should have been happy to have introduced to her my charming Sophia, and should with cheerfulness have passed the remainder of my life in their dear society in the Vale of Usk, had not one obstacle to the execution of so agreeable a scheme intervened, which was the marriage and removal of your mother to a distant part of Ireland. Adieu, Laura. End of Part One